that bends. I, I have to move the mic for you. I'm sorry. Thank you all for joining us today. I know lots of you are here to see Dr. Dale Bredesen, who will be here. He's currently stuck in traffic, so he'll be here in just a few minutes. Um, I'm guessing a lot of you are not APO E4 carriers. Um, and a lot of you are probably saying, what is APO E4? It's a gene, and it's a gene that's most closely associated with a common form of Alzheimer's. Um, we are members of the APOE4.info community, and we're sponsoring this talk. I have a lovely introduction for Dr. Bredesen, who's going to miss it, but we're so delighted that he's here to join us. He is the only one of our speakers who has been at all three of our annual gatherings, so we're very, very honored and humbled by that. Um, for those of you who don't know Dr. Bredesen, he doesn't need an introduction in our community, but for those of you who aren't familiar with him, he's a scientist who turned the Alzheimer's landscape upside down by writing a paper in the fall of 2014 entitled Reversal from Cognitive Decline, a Novel Therapeutic Program. And in this paper, he did 10 case studies and nine out of 10 of these, he was able to reverse dementia to a point where the people were able to return to work. That was unprecedented um, until that time. And how did he do this? He applied several dozen strategies, one of which was a low carb diet. Um, Dr. Bredesen is more widely disseminating his approach. He has a book coming out at the end of this month entitled The End of Alzheimer's. It's published by Random House, and it's coming out August 22nd. So we're very excited about that. And the e4.info community is mentioned in the book. Um, he has a chapter on the role of social media in spreading and disseminating the prevention and reversal message. The medical community has nothing to offer us. So social media has played a huge role in disseminating this life-saving information. Today, Dr. Bredesen is going to be talking about a little-known condition called SIRS, that's C-I-R-S, and that stands for Chronic Inflammatory Response Syndrome. And although it's a little-known condition, he's found that it's playing a big role in Alzheimer's disease. He's going to tell us the backstory about how he stumbled upon this connection and kind of fill us in on that and the Chief Medical Officer of his company, MPI Cognition, Dr. Mary Kay Ross, is joining us today. She's a integrative practitioner in uh, Savannah, Georgia, and she specializes in SERS. Um, she has lots of credentials and qualifications, but the most important one is she's a SERS patient. So she's living with and um, surviving with SERS. Um, and Mary Kay is going to dive into the nuts and bolts of SIRS, what it is, who should test, how to test, and hopefully how to treat. So thank you all for joining us and welcome. Um, 
lots of studies are coming out that are um, tying toxins in the environment into um, cognitive problems. We've always known about cancers. We know they cause inflammation. But now we know that it really is being associated with cognitive problems and with Alzheimer's. So when I talk about toxins, so I gave this talk in March at an immersion program that we had, and I really focused on biotoxins. Now I'm going to include the environmental aspect as well, because I really think that that's a very important component. And I probably <laughs> have 60 patients with Dr. Redison that I manage that have, most of them have Alzheimer's, but a great deal of them also have cog just cognitive uh, impairment. And I'll tell you some of the stories because the it's astounding how much toxins are involved. Um, when we talk about biotoxins, we're talking about mold, we're talking about algae, we're talking about Lyme disease, which I think a lot of people might be surprised at. Um, we're talking about envenomations from other things, um, food poisoning as well. And then of course heavy metals are a toxin that can cause cognitive impairment mm -hmm. um, as well. And so when we talk about what's new on the horizon, I think this is really an interesting um, topic because there have been several studies recently that have come out that correlate pollution, especially like automobile emissions with uh, cognitive decline with Alzheimer's, and they, there was a study recently, it was done by Duke, Emory, and uh, the University of Georgia Technical College. And what they did, there's a machine that they put on the side of the road and they monitor emissions. Well, they put a machine in the automobiles and they monitored people driving in rush hour traffic. And it's pretty astounding. They found that you would get double the dose. Hmm. So it's pretty scary. So if you think about the, it's particulate matter um, that we're inhaling, and there's also been studies with rats that show with radioisotopes tagged particles that they actually get into the cerebellum. So it's it's very scary. Does anybody know aerotoxic syndrome? Has anybody ever heard of that? So aerotoxic syndrome, I think this is really important to um, how many people feel sick when they fly on an airplane? So that's a real thing. So aerotoxic syndrome, they use bleed air is what they call it. So they actually take the air that is around the engine and they put it in the cabin. That's right, right. I mean, that's, that is brilliant. And um, it's warm air. But when it, but the tubing sometimes vibrates and you can tell me if you know any different. And there's leaks that can occur. So my understanding is that that's when you really get the toxins, and so that's what you're breathing in. So when you smell off-gassing and you feel like you're breathing chemicals, you oftentimes are. And I think the oil that leaks can actually has a compound in it that's similar to organophosphates. So there's been deaths, actually, from pilots that have had neurodegenerative diseases um, from organophosphate poisoning. And, and so that's like a pesticide. <coughs> so the double whammy, this is the one with the rush hour traffic. I just think it's astounding. And the scientists that actually conducted this study said, you know, if we really believe that these chemicals are that dangerous, people are going to really have to think about the traffic that they drive in, sitting there and inhaling this. Because this is going to be a huge factor down the road because the world is just not the same anymore. Exercise versus pollution. So is it better to exercise? Do you, do you forego it or do you get out in the pollution? This study states that the benefits outweigh the pollution risk. But I want to tell you, I have a patient. He's 55 years old. So most of my patients are actually very young and they're in their 50s. And oftentimes they have severe Alzheimer's. So this particular patient has a hippocampal volume of 5%, okay, which is very low. And um, he lived in Washington, D.C. He was a cyclist. He's never owned a car. And he would cycle to work and in the traffic every day. He also lived in a basement apartment. 
that was very damp and musty smelling. Like um, just like this room. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I know. Yeah, we're going to hopefully everybody can detox really well tonight. Um, but so he has developed, it's almost more, he's almost more encephalopathic. He's living with his mother. And they recently just came to Savannah. So I've been bringing really difficult patients to Savannah and in my neighborhood and actually putting a program together there where I know I have a clean house and everything. And he's starting to make strides. But if you think about it, he had the mold exposure. His mycotoxins were through the roof. Um, he was inhaling automobile exhaust all day long, every day. Um, and he had stress. Stress is a huge factor that I think people don't think about enough. And, and how we manage stress is major. Um, stress will flat out kill you in so many ways. And so he was the editor of a magazine that wrote about human atrocities in Syria. So you can imagine how pleasant that is. Um, but so this is just one thing I think that, that we really need to change.
So here's chronic inflammatory response syndrome. Dr. Richie Shoemaker is the one that discovered this. Um, he's a physician at Brooklyn, Maryland, and he has um, a long history working with mold and biotoxin illness. Um, and it's a multi-symptom illness, supposedly. And this is where, where I think it really gets interesting. It's caused by exposure to biotoxins. It's usually people that have the susceptibility. 5% of the people, though, that don't also can get sick just the same. 25% um, of the population, as I mentioned. And HLA susceptibility really is how your immune system presents a foreigner, basically. So here we have, I'm hit, I'm hit, go on without me. And this is bacteria trying to avoid the immune system. But our immune system recognizes foreigners normally, and our innate immune system has two arms. And basically what serves in the HLA susceptible person, it's almost like one arm is tied. So if you're someone who has mold in your house, it could be at work, it could be at home, you know, it's just like this room. You recognize that it's a sick room. I knew it the minute I walked in. So we can work in environments also where, you know, people will notice that people are getting sick around them and they're getting sick. It's a toxic stew. It literally is mold. It's bacteria. It's uh, VOCs. Um, it's viruses. It's, it's just a toxic stew that creates inflammation. And it's the inflammation really that damages us so badly. So we, it creates the release of cytokines, which are chemicals that our body makes in response. <laughs> and it creates all of the inflammatory things that actually kill neurons um, and damage our brain, damage the memory, damage the hippocampus. And some of the chemicals that we measure, MMP9 is one of them, TGF beta 1, and I know these are names that are foreign to you, and I understand that at the end of this, some of you are doctors, some of you are patients, or people that are just interested. I will have a list of the things that we need to use to test, and we can put it up on the APOE site, and then anybody, even if you're not in that group, you can access them, okay? This is a busy slide, and um, I'm not really, I'm, just kind of using it as an example. You see Shoemaker up in the corner. This is Dr. Shoemaker's biotoxin pathway. And this is sort of how he sees that things work. And the big blue arrow is actually the body taking on a biotoxin. So it can be breathing in mold, spores, mycotoxins, and all the rest of that toxics too, quite frankly, because it's all there and you're just breathing it in. Um, the arrow going down the left is actually what a person who does not have the susceptibility, what their body typically does with it. So they might get a little sick, they may have a little problem, but their liver and their detox system can get rid of it, okay? But then going off to the right, you see those two arrows, it comes in and it's, and, and I think of it kind of like a castle with a big wall and all of the guards are out front looking, but in the back there's a huge hole in that wall and the animals are just walking in and walking out at will. That's what our immune system does when we're HLA susceptible, okay? And so these toxins come in and they bind on cell receptors and they damage them. So with SIRS, people can develop something called leptin resistance where they actually gain a tremendous amount of weight. It doesn't really matter what they do, they can't get rid of it. And it damages um, the leptin receptor in the hypothalamus in the brain. It lowers MSH, melanocyte stimulating hormone, which is a neuroregulatory hormone. It lowers VIP, basal intestinal polypeptide, which is another neuroregulatory hormone. It's really important to remember that. But all of that causes all of these symptoms. And so this is very different than the cognitive people that I see that have these elevated markers. They don't have these symptoms. Um, sleep disturbances, chronic pain, GI problems, so more like irritable bowel type symptoms, um, prolonged illness. People feel like they get, they catch everything and they can't really always get over it either. 
Changes in cortisol and ACTH, very important. So you probably know that cortisol is your adrenal gland hormone and it's for stress. But what is stress, okay? So yes, losing your house, your spouse cheating on you, all of those things are stress, but so is living in a sick environment. Mm -hmm. So your body has all these crazy fluctuations because of what it's been going through and cortisol goes crazy. And I'll explain a little more about that in a minute. But reduced androgens, so sex hormones go down as well. And um, reduced ADH. Interesting, a lot of biotoxin patients will say, I urinate all the time, I get thirsty all the time, and then some of them, and I live in a very humid place, so this is really unusual, will have frequent static electric shocks. And it's because the biotoxins actually charge particles. And, and it, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. The yellow box is resistant coag negative staph bacteria. That's Marcon's multiple antibiotic resistant coagulase negative staph. And it's an uh, infection that occurs in the deep, deep sinuses. And it perpetuates this inflammation as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is SERPs. And so how do you diagnose it? If you suspect it, you're going to have all these symptoms, right? So. You know, if you live in a, a moldy home, um, if you have leaks, you can get a test on your home called an ERMI, an Environmental Relative Moldiness Index. But what if you just have cognitive impairment? Is that SIRS? And that is really one of the million dollar questions. So I'm wondering if it's more of a neurodegenerative <coughs> inflammatory response syndrome. And maybe because of our genetics, Maybe some of us develop SIRS, and maybe some of us develop the neurodegenerative inflammatory response syndrome. And this is something that we're interested in and looking at. Initially, Dr. Bredesen, who um, just walked in, um, thought 30% of the population would have the toxic type. We're seeing it in around 65%, and I have a feeling it's going to be bigger. Mm. So. When you want to do a laboratory evaluation, and this isn't everything, but really what, what I do, I like to look for all of the inflammatory cytokines, and there's a whole list of them that we look at. Um, and then, if I start to see that this inflammation is there, then you can dig deeper and you can go further. Um, I usually do most of the labs through LabCorp. Um, some of them can be obtained through Quest, and insurance oftentimes will cover most of it. Um, they don't cover the genetic part, the HLA susceptibility. Um, I swab for Marcons because if they have Marcons, it needs to be eradicated um, or it just perpetuates this whole inflammatory response. I check the urine for mycotoxins. Now, that is a controversial thing. Some people believe that mycotoxins, which they do, come from foods that you eat, and so they're not sure that it's an accurate test. But when you see something that's 10 or 12 times higher or more, and then you test the home with an ERMI and you find the mold in the home that makes that mycotoxin, I just think that kind of sort of brings it all full circle. Um, this is an MRI neuroquant or neuroreader is another um, option. And this <coughs> is actually um, an MRI. And then they apply this software for the neuroquant or the neuroreader. And it gives us information on the volume, the volumes of the brain. And it looks at the hippocampus, which hippocampal volume is very important in the treatment, and especially when you're applying the Bredesen protocol. Interesting story. I have a patient. Um, she is 62. She was a nurse practitioner. And she's the first Bredesen patient that I treated. Um, she's been a patient of mine for gosh, I guess a year and four months, year and three months, something like that. And her husband is an orthopedic surgeon. So they came to my office and they were coming out to California to see Dr. Bredesen and we obtained the labs. And, you know, I felt like she may have more inflammatory markers. And I checked them and they were all through the roof. Hmm. In talking with her, and, and when I first met her, her uh, hippocampal volume was 1%. She was not engaged at all in conversation. Um, she had had to quit work and things were really falling apart in their lives. And 
she had been worried about her memory. And this happens a lot with cognitive patients. Um, so she said something to her husband, she said something to other doctors, and everybody kind of blew her off and said, oh, you know what, you've got a lot of stress in your life, you got too much going on, you're worried about your mom who incidentally was dying of Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And so she had a neuroquant MRI because she was you know, diligent and wanted to get this um, diagnosed if she had a problem. And the neuroquant was read as normal. Retrospectively, I have looked at that neuroquant and I actually have a spreadsheet that I apply to the neuroquant, and it gives me other information than the hippocampal volume. It actually lets you know if they have a pattern that looks like mold, or looks like Lyme, or looks like MS, and other things. And this is from Dr. Shoemaker's work. And I applied that to hers, and it looked like profound mold. Wow. Now, when she came to see me, we had, a, we had another repeat study one year later and she had a 1% hippocampal volume and all bets are off. You couldn't tell any more about her MRI. So it's interesting. So this is actually a tool that's very helpful. And so I just think people need to understand when we talk about mold that you can, it takes 30 hours from the time you spring a leak and you know, let's face it, we all build our buildings out of mold food for the most part. We put plumbing in the walls, and you know, I don't know anybody that hasn't had a leak. Um, it's important to think about. Where I live in Savannah, it's really humid, so we are great mold, mold growers. And the HVAC, again, size matters, so oftentimes people think if they get a larger HVAC system that it's better, or sometimes you'll end up with a small one, but it, it ends up making condensation and it grows mold. It's, it's a big problem. This is an example of a sick building, obviously. And this is an example of another one, and this is my patient's home. So it's kind of interesting, and this is, I really want to drive home to a, a point that if you are, if two people are in the same environment, they can have completely opposite responses. So I received a phone call from a guy who lives on an outlying island. He's been sick forever. He thinks he has Lyme. He wasn't sure. And he works from home. He's very smart, but he just can't leave his house. So I Skyped with him. And then I told him, I, really, I found all kinds of stuff, and I thought he had mold. And I said, you know, I really can't treat you, though, if I can't at least see you once in the office. And he couldn't come in. So the next thing he does is he sends me his mother. And his mother has Alzheimer's. Hmm. So I do a workup on her. She's got mold. And so I called him back and I said, listen, you know, I'd be glad to get her started on the bread and her and do all these things. But the bottom line is if she's in mold, she is not going to get better. Well, it ended up, he called me. He, first, he wouldn't test the house. We don't have mold. I've got Lyme. She's got Alzheimer's. It's that easy. They sent me this picture. I was floored. The wall fell in on its own. So the thing on the right is the wall that abutted up to that black stuff on the left. Oh my God. Is that crazy? This is what they were living in. So now they moved into a, an RV in the yard, and the problem is they kept going in and out, so they've contaminated it. Mm. They had their house fixed somewhat. The mother still has Alzheimer's, but he has been able to leave the home and come and start being a patient. Yeah, and better, a little bit, just with that remediation. So it's interesting, but they both had different symptoms. So the most important thing if you have a mold exposure is to get out of the mold. You've got to get out. If you don't get out, you're not going to get better, period. Binders, um, cholestyramine is the one that we use. That's a prescription. And the binders actually adhere, or sort of, they. it's really it has to do with the charge. Um, get the particles of mold, of the toxins out of your system. They bind it in the gut, and then you pass them out rather than reabsorbing them. But there's a lot of different binders, so I didn't really just put cholestyramine down, because we use a lot of different things now. We do um, apple citrus pectin, um, we do GI detox, there's, just, there's a vast array. And there's lots of reasons to pick different ones for different people. VIP nasal spray is really important. I use it um, for hippocampal volume, and I'm getting ready to rescan 
the brain of the nurse practitioner that I mentioned to you because she's doing great. She honestly is almost 100% back, which is astounding. Um, and then if you have mold, you always have to retest before you go back in. I'm just going to give you a quick, this really deserves a lot more time, blurb on Lyme. Because a lot of doctors don't believe, A, in chronic Lyme. They don't believe that Lyme exists except for in certain parts of the country, and that's it. And then you have to have, you know, your female migrants and the whole bed where you don't get treated. So the bad news is you have Lyme. The good news is I don't believe in that disease, so you're fine. And that is the response that people get. So if you ever think that you are exposed or have Lyme, you need to find a Lyme literate physician trained by ILADS. Testing is horrible. ILADS is the International Lyme and Tick Associated Disease Group. I trained with them. And testing is horrible. So you get a lot of uh, false negatives. So there's a lot of other testing that can be done. Just remember people in the ocean, people you know, in towns where um, they have algal blooms, it's also a biotoxin. So what does a bathtub have to do with it? I think about everybody as a tub. We're all tubs. <laughs> think about the tubs that you've seen in your life. They're small, they're big, there's garden tubs, there's, you know, when we are born, we are like a shiny clean tub. We fill up easily, we drain easily, life is good. And the draining is really similar to our genetics. How good of a detoxer are you? So it's almost really like having a tub and you go through life, like let's just say, maybe your mother and father were smokers. Maybe you grew up on a farm and they sprayed chemicals and you had that. And these all go into like a layering in your tub and it fills up as life goes on. It seems like, in, unless you had a really small tub, it seems like most people are around 40, 50, that's when you start getting a full tub and, and life happens and that's when your hormones drop, stress is high, and then maybe you have a big exposure and that is what we call your tipping factor. And so you have to always, I always sit down and really do a thorough history through IFM, and I don't know if anybody here has been to IFM, but through IFM they do a great thing called the Living Matrix and I go back and look at everything from birth I want to know everything about your life because all of those things are the layers in your tub and then we figure out what in the world is it that made you sick that tipped you over mm -hmm. and and then we try to undo it and that's really how functional medicine operates it's the really possible <coughs> and I think that we all have an internal roadmap to illness and to health and and I think it's important really to think about that but that's why some people develop cognitive problems. Other people develop autoimmune disease. Some people just get cancer, you know, and I think it's, it can be from the same things. Um, it's sort of that internal roadmap. So, this is my house, and I'll tell you a little bit about my story. I'm not going to take too long with it, but nice house. I lived there for 14 years. Things were good, and I started developing respiratory illnesses, arthritis, I developed psoriatic arthritis, or at least I was diagnosed with it. Um, thyroid nodules and had autoimmune thyroid disease. And while that was going on, my husband was developing weird skin things, but he developed cognitive problems. I didn't have the cognitive problems, but I almost went on disability. I mean, I was like the poster child for SERPs. So these are signs that you know you're living with mold, unless you just have memory issues. So I had joint pain, rashes, shortness of breath, ear ringing, vertigo, um, chest pain, chronic cough, always clearing my throat. I couldn't talk for 10 minutes. Um, it was crazy. I mean, if I was with a patient, I would go running down the hall and almost vomit from coughing. It was, it's awful. I uh, couldn't sleep. I don't think I slept for two years. This is what happened to Stephen's neck, my husband. It's a little up close and personal. <laughs> this is taco subo. Anybody ever heard of it? I had it. So, yeah. So I had, I knew that I was sick, so I was doing all this fancy testing, and my cortisol was through the roof. If the page had been higher, 
I could have gone higher. And so I went to go give grand rounds and started having chest pain. And I thought, well, this is kind of crazy, you know, and I don't have a problem lecturing. I'm fine with that. And I was having all this pain and kind of trying to figure out what it was. And um, at the end of the day, it was a Friday, I ended up going to the emergency room. And I was a previous emergency room physician, so they kind of stuck me in the back and everybody thought it was just gonna be fine and checked my troponin, which was slightly elevated. So I went to the cath lab. This is what I had. Takosubo is Japanese for octopus pot, and that's the shape that your heart takes. When you are making too much cortisol, you're also making epinephrine and norepinephrine, and it's done the left ventricle, and it just wasn't pumping right. So a lot of people die from it. I was very lucky. Um, I didn't really have any other symptoms. I just had to spend the weekend on a monitor bed. These, this is my gut in my home. This is what it looked like. So behind those walls was a very sick house. Um, and they used fiber optic cameras and went in and took pictures. And we're still out of our house. We, we left everything behind that we owned. So how do you protect yourself? Because really that's the key. And I think, um, I don't think you need to wait until you're sick, honestly. So you do the things that we all know we should do. But you actually practice them. You need to eat a clean diet, be mindful of the chemicals you use. So if you really believe, like I do, that it's a layering type of thing, you know, don't slather yourself with parabens and all kinds of things because that's easy to do. Um, so be mindful. Manage your stress. I think that's important. I think mindfulness training, anything that you can do to manage your stress is huge. Um, stay balanced with your hormones. Recently, I was on a conference call with a bunch of people at IFM, and we were talking about a program that we're putting together. And one of the things that I thought was so interesting, so IFM has never been big on hormones. I've always felt like they needed to be a little more in, in the hormone direction. Now they are. And they said, you know, we really missed the boat on the 45 to 65-year-old females. We should have kept their hormones going. And I think it's important. I think that you can do it in a safe way, Exercise is huge, um, and in the breast and protocol, exercise is very important. Um, it increases BDNF for the brain, and interval training or more of like an aerobic type exercise is good. Sleep, that's when our body heals itself, really. Um, that's a time of detox, and so we need to really work on sleep and work on, on really how we organize our life, because we can't control the, the toxic world that we live in, but we can control what we do. Ramp up the detox when you feel like you've been exposed. So boy, oh boy, we were on an airplane coming out of here, and poor Stephen, he was coughing and sneezing, and he felt horrible. By the time we got out here, and it, it was awful. And I'm sure it was that aerotoxic syndrome thing. But you know, ramp up the knack. Do things that you can do to increase your liver um, detox, and just be proactive and listen to your body. Consider toxins as more of the root cause of an illness. It can be. I'm not going to read these to you. These are basic testing that I that I do. Um, when I do a thyroid panel, I do a much more detailed one than most people. Um, genetic testing, I think MTHFR is pertinent for the toxins. There's a lot of testing, obviously, that you can do. And you can get a 23andMe and we can plug it in. But the bottom line is these are three biggies. The HLA-DR is very important. And secondary testing. So I do use the mycotoxin test on patients, and just, you know, if you're a provider, it's important to know that Medicare covers it, um, TRICARE covers it. It's expensive, I don't do it on everybody. It's about $700. Um, if somebody's going to court, it's important to have one. I do a Marcon test on everybody, um, and I treat it with bag spray. Or sometimes I've also used Argentin 23. I just feel a little funny about putting metals up in the head though with people that have cognitive problems. So I don't do that anymore. Um, ERMI is Environmental Relative Moldiness Index. It comes from Micometrics, and that's how you test your home. Heavy metals testing, there's two ways that I do it. Um, and then the Lyme test, you know, there's, there's a lot of options and a lot of information out there. <coughs> this is. Dr. Bredesen's recipe for reversal of cognitive decline is just the way that I kind of view it. 
And so I just put it on a brain. But all of these are aspects of the program that are really important to practice. So it's sleeping, it's eating right, it's exercising, it's exercising your brain, it's mindfulness practice, it's getting your hormones and thinking about toxins. Just remember to look for the bad guys. Do you guys have any questions? You want me to take questions now? Um, why don't we move on to Dr. Brennan okay, and then we'll take questions at the end. Thank you so much. Actually, it was pretty nice actually. 
But that way you don't buy furniture, you're not worried about having somebody else's furniture, because if you rent, you don't know what you're getting. It's an unknown. And if you just moved out of your house, you probably don't have the money to go buy a bunch of new furniture, and you don't know what you're gonna do. So that's what I did. Um, it's important to get the right person to fix your house. There's um, a person that I use that actually helps give a protocol to contractors because they don't have a clue. And mold people, when you look up mold people online, like in your city, they can be everything from a weekend uh, course to like having their masters, and you will never know the difference. So it's really important to choose the person right. Mm -hmm. So we use Greg Weatherman, is who I've been using with Arabological. Um, he's one of Dr. Shoemaker's people. Yes. So I have mold, but it's on the outside of my house because I had to build a deck that's slate covered with a bunch of water membranes. And so it's not technically in my home, but it's in a, in a, um, in a, on a deck that's completely concealed. So it, because they, had, they made it so this deck wouldn't burn and the fire couldn't get under it. And Been the area that people go in and into it if they're if they're not interested in treating. 
Um, and that's actually been one of the challenges that a lot of people who are neurologists who've been around forever, they were selected because they are people who don't worry so much about treatment. They're very good with diagnostics. Of course, Sherlock Holmes was based on a neurologist. Very good with diagnostics, not so great um, with therapy sometimes. And of course, we want to change all that. We want to be helping to tell people, hey, there are a lot of things you can do, but you need to expand the database. So I want to spend a few minutes talking about how are we going to lift the fog of 20th century medicine? When we go to our doctor today, it's almost always to a doctor who is practicing 20th century medicine. And this is where functional medicine, integrative medicine, and what Lee Hood calls P4 medicine are making such a huge impact. Because, you know, think about it. You're, you're in a very, very complex organism, and your doctor is taking a very, very non-complex data set and then trying to figure out, you know, what went wrong and really, it really doesn't make sense. If you look at this as a physicist or a chemist or a, a physical scientist, um, it really makes no sense the way we practice medicine. And this is why 21st century medicine has to change everything. So the data sets that we collect um, are on exceedingly complex organisms, but the data sets are tiny. So you come in and you say, I can't remember things. And they say, well, what's your sodium? What's your potassium? And then they say, you know what? You have Alzheimer's. And it's very mysterious. We don't understand it. Well, no kidding. You know, we, we didn't look very far. Um, so not, you know, not surprising. And then what do we do? We take these incredibly complex organisms where something is going wrong and it's very complicated, and we give you a monotherapy. And it doesn't work. And we say, wow, we just keep looking. We keep testing drug after drug after drug. And so you know, I think many people are familiar with the term Occam's razor. Um, because this is, you know, you want to do the simplest thing. So my argument is that we have entered the area, entered the era of Occam's network. Hmm. So we're no longer looking for that monotherapy that's going to patch that one hole. We're looking for a specific network which is abnormal, and that's what we discovered with Alzheimer's. There's one network for Alzheimer's. There's a different network for Parkinson's. There's a different network for ALS, and we need to use that Occam's network approach to find the critical network for each of these diseases. And the monotherapies are probably not the, not the way to go. The other thing that's amazing to me is doctors have no trouble giving you a therapy that's completely non-physiological. Why do you want to do that? This is like saying, you know, you've got a flat tire. Well, you can pump it up and fix it. No, you don't want to do that. No, you want to take it off and have someone carry it while you go with the other three tires. I mean, it makes no sense. The sort of things that we're doing for this illness are non-physiological. We want to do completely the physiological approach, just exactly as, as uh, Dr. Ross would think. And in, in, you know, in my opinion, Dr. Ross is the leading expert when it comes to this type 3 Alzheimer's disease. And if I ever get type 3 Alzheimer's disease, I'm going to see Dr. Ross. She's, uh, she's done an absolutely fabulous job. The other thing is, you know, we, we do things the way the diseases were hitting us 100 years ago. They were simple diseases like pneumococcal pneumonia and diphtheria. They were infectious illnesses. And we there wait, you know, we wait for the symptoms to appear and say, aha, you've got pneumonia, we've got to treat it. Well, that's not the way these complex chronic illnesses work. We can see them coming 20 years ahead of time. So let's do that. We should be getting a cognoscopy when we are relatively young, 45, 50, so that we see these things coming. We can tell, you know what, you're still doing very well, but you know, you're headed for problems. We can see that in your insulin resistance, or we can see that with your ongoing inflammation, or you, we can see it with your SERS markers. Jump on it now. That is the future. If we're going to reduce the global burden of dementia, then we're going to want to jump on this before we have symptoms. And then calling the only, this always gets me, calling the only effective treatment alternative. <laughs> so yeah, so yeah we're going to do standard therapy. We're going to give you something that doesn't work at all. <laughs> okay. Oh, you want to go alternative? You want something that actually works? Oh, well, that's that's alternative medicine. We don't deal with that here. You know why is this? I mean, instead of calling it alternative medicine, it should be called effective medicine because that's what it is. And as you know, you know, unprecedented improvements in type two diabetes, autoimmune disease, heart failure, Alzheimer's, all these things when you take a more physiological and multi-component approach. When you actually look at what's causing the problem. And then teaching medical students, as the guy told me, you know, we're just going to, he said, he said, we teach them this, he says, because they believe our lies. Mm -hmm. well, he said, yeah. and this is an epilepsy expert, he said, I mean, this yeah. guy's been a friend of ours for a long time, and he's a great guy. He's one of my favorite people, I have to say, he's, I really admire <coughs> this person, wonderful human being, but he's completely into, this is the way medicine works. 
So he said, you know, when I tell people about my epilepsy research, he said, I tell them it's a lie. We, we really don't understand epilepsy, and I tell them that. He said, but they believe all of us. So we just keep teaching them to them. Well, you know, we need to do better than that. Then, you know, forcing patients to accept ineffective therapy. With side effects, we say, okay, we're gonna teach, you know, we're gonna give you these drugs and they're gonna have terrible side effects, but these are the only things that your insurance covers. You know, this is a, a bad way to go. And then, of course, refusing to cover what actually works. This is what we hear all the time. Well, you know, if you really want to get better from your cognitive decline, you need to do these three things. Oh, but those aren't covered. So, you know, maybe they shouldn't be covered. Uh, so, we want to change the way we think about these things. We want to change. In 20th century, medicine was all about what is it? That was the question. You became a diagnostician. You say, aha, this is. You know, this is uh, Lewy body disease, you know, or this is measles, you know, or this is uh, you know, type 2 diabetes, what have you. 21st century medicine is completely different. It's about the why. Why did you get this? And if we're going to ask why in a complex system, we need to look at a complex data set. So here we have osteoporosis, right? So we know what, how this works. We know that the osteoblastic activity, the making the bone, is exceeded by the osteoclastic, taking the bone up. And that's the basis. Great, we can fix this now because we understand it. Cancer, same general idea. Too much cytoplastic activity, too little cytoplastic activity. Same idea. You're making too many cells, you're keeping too many cells, you're not turning them over. So you need to change that. And of course, a lot of stuff coming out on ketogenic approaches and going back to the old Warburg hypothesis, very, very interesting and it's very intriguing. And what we discovered in 28 years in the lab now is no different. That in fact there is a whole set of signals that are synaptoblastic, that are literally making your memories and keeping your memories. And the good news, we can measure them. We will, the molecular biology of this, we can see where it's coming from, and we can measure all the different things that Mary Kay was talking about to say why are you on the wrong side of this? If you are having cognitive decline, then by definition everybody will have too much synaptoclastic activity. You can literally see the signaling pulling back and too little of the synaptoblastic side. So what, how do we treat it? We increase all these things and we decrease all these things. And the interesting thing is as we're going through this, we're seeing new things that we didn't know about before. And actually, Dr. Ross has been seeing some patients recently from New York City, one of whom was in the World Trade Center cloud. So I don't know if you're aware of the statistics, they are very scary. The people who were in the World Trade Center cloud, 12.8% of them, these are people in their 50s now, who already have cognitive decline, mm -hmm. tested by physicians, so 1.2% already fully demented. Wow. So this is a coming mini epidemic for people. Then the question that came up from one person was, well, does that mean people at New York have some increased risk? don't know. It's a very good question. Mm -hmm. So it'll be interesting to see and hopefully we'll, again, we want to see it ahead of time. It would be nice to have everybody tested to say, where do you stand? Do you already have innate immune system activation? This is a huge issue. Then another person, and I get these thousands and thousands of emails, another one was another woman from New York City, um, also now seeing Dr. Ross, um, who worked in a place that burned candles 24-7. Many of them. And her husband couldn't even come in because he would get sick. He knew he was sick. But she rose up through the ranks and she was a very high ranking official there, so she was exposed for years. And she developed this very this special kind of type 3 Alzheimer's disease. Um, and definitely in her case, you look at the toxins, and they're the exact toxins that come from paraffin candle burning. So if you're going to be burning candles all the time, you know, you want to be pollen sort of candles or beeswax candles. You do not want paraffin candles. They actually have toxins in them that are, that are quite damaging. So there are lots of things that we're finding out that alter this balance. But the good news is there are some fundamental ones. Anything that causes ongoing inflammation, anything that causes insulin resistance and ongoing uh, uh, high insulin and uh, high sugars, anything that causes a sudden reduction in trophic support, be it estradiol, vitamin D, uh, thyroid hormone, uh, you name it, B12, testosterone, pregnenolone, all these things are there. BDNF, nerve growth factor, all these things support this incredibly wonderful network of, of neurons you've got in your brain. And so when you suddenly pull them away, what do you do? Your brain downsizes the network. No surprise. It's just like what happens if your company's going to downsize. 
first thing that the boss says <clears throat> is, okay, we can't hire any new people. And that's exactly what happens in your brain. You say, okay, uh, we're gonna keep what we can, but we cannot add new things. So you can actually look at this at the molecular level. So here's, this is the amyloid precursor protein, ATP, and it's sitting, here's the cell membrane, here's inside the cell, here's outside the cell. And what we discovered a number of years ago was really intriguing. This thing is a molecular switch. It's the thing that's telling you, am I gonna build synapses, or am I gonna pull them back? Am I gonna reorganize, am I gonna lose memory, am I gonna forget, or am I gonna remember? So we want you to be on the making new memory side, these two, if you cut here, there's a molecular scissors that comes along called alpha secretase. Cuts here, you make these two things, and they're great. They're trophic, they're anti-Alzheimer's. You're building synapses. But the same parent molecule can also be cut in an alternative way, these three, and you get four things. And guess what, here's familiar, all this is A beta. So this is the stuff that collects in the brains of people with Alzheimer's disease. And of course, what are the drug companies trying to do? They're trying to get rid of this stuff. Well, to begin with, it's a much bigger story, as you can see. But more importantly, this stuff is made because it is protecting you from insults. It's now known to be a very good antimicrobial peptide. Uh, Robert Warren and, and uh, Rudy Tanzi and the groups at, at Harvard have shown that this thing is a very potent, endogenous antimicrobial peptide. Guess what else it does? It binds toxins, it binds copper, it binds mercury beautifully. So it is protecting you. And no surprise, we've therefore had people who went on anti-amyloid therapy and got much worse. And you can see it, they have a very characteristic pattern. They get the therapy, they get much worse, and they slowly start coming. By the time they get the next, uh, like typically a month later, the next injection, they're almost back to where they were. And so one woman, the guy had just gone like this, and I said to her, well, why did you stay? And she said, they're the doctors, they know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Okay, but her husband had gone from a, a, a mini mental state of 24 to six <laughs> while they're doing this over two years. And each time it would just get much, much worse. So this is the problem. If, you're, if this is actually being used to protect yourself, what you want to do is get rid of what it's protecting you from. Get yes. rid of the problem, <laughs> not get rid of the stuff. I mean, it, it's like sending the police home when everyone's house is getting robbed. No, the police, they, someone could get hurt, go home. <laughs> and okay, then you, you know, this makes absolutely no sense. So interestingly, the downstream stuff comes from here. So depending on which direction you go, you can actually see. Now the good news, you can actually then say, okay, in mice, and so we always hear this stuff about someone cured Alzheimer's in mice again. In mice, you're just making a lot of extra amyloid. So there's, it's not like the human condition, unfortunately, except for the very, very few people who actually have APP mutations, less than 1% of Alzheimer's cases. So here's APP, so we wanted to know what are all the things that actually feed into that? So in a human being, what goes wrong? And the answer is Occam's network. There is a whole network of things. You can trigger this to go to the wrong side by reducing your testosterone, by reducing your B12, by reducing your thyroid, by exposing yourself to mycotoxins, by having NF-kappa B activated because you're inflamed for years, by eating too much sugar, by eating trans fats, by staying up too late, all these things. And of course, each one of them, the, you know, the, some of the doctors that I treat will tell me, well, you know, that's, that's not a cure for Alzheimer's. No, not by itself. But why would you leave it out? We have, we're in a system where the network has changed, and we now want to change that balance in the network so that we can return it to its optimal functioning. That's the key. So we're not after one thing. And by the way, usually one thing is not enough. In all the people we see, there is a minimum of 10, and usually it's between 10 and 25 suboptimal numbers when we look at their insulin status, we look at their hemoglobin A1C, we look at their SERS markers. Now, there's, I've never seen a person that just has one reason for having cognitive decline. So this is why I always tell people it's a roof with 36 holes, a drug is gonna be great, it patches one hole really well, and so that's great, patch that hole, but then make sure that you do all the other things as well. And if you get early, you may not need a drug after all. So as you know, the perfect Alzheimer's drug would do this. And this is the problem. So we've actually been screening. We have an active drug screening effort at UCLA. We actually have a, a drug that's going to go into clinical trials uh, next year called C41. We have another one that's already in clinical trials called Tropicitron. But 
It's, it was back in 2011 when we were looking at this first one for Pisafron that we had discovered because I understood that there was this balance, you know, cut one way, cut the other way. I said, okay, let's screen for drugs that make it so you go to the other side of the balance. Great idea, it worked, we found one. Then I realized, wait a minute, there are all these other inputs. We gotta cover them somehow. So I thought, you know, we should have brain training. Well, wait a minute, we have to. Then it really suddenly hit me, oh my gosh, we have to add everything. It's not just doing one thing. So this is what your drug has to do, and this is why you need more than a single drug. So, surprise, Alzheimer's is a protective response. Three major metabolic and toxic perturbations. Inflammation, as I mentioned, withdrawal of trophic support, that's the type one, type two, and then exposure to toxins, such as divalent metals and, of course, mycotoxins. And the most common one seems to be, as Dr. Ross was saying, um, exposure to mycotoxins. And again, there are, there are people who have multiple toxins. We're finding that that seems to be the rule, not the exception. People seem to have exposure to a lot. So these form the basis for type one, type two, type three, and they're quite different. Combinations, very common, so we have a computer-based algorithm that'll tell you you have 70% type one and 20% type two, 10% type three, or what have you. And then of course, other things like sleep apnea, vascular insufficiency, all these things can also trigger through these same pathways. So, Julie asked us to talk a little bit about the type three, and I think that was a really good point because it's turning out to be incredibly common. So what happened was, we had in our first 10 patients, nine who got better and one who just did not get better. And I thought, hey, what are we missing here? What's, what's wrong? She looked different, she acted different. And we started realizing, wait a minute, this is another kind of Alzheimer's. So I started calling all the spouses and saying, where did they grow up and what happened and all this stuff. And I realized these are people that had toxic exposures. And I realized also that a lot of them have SIRS numbers, this chronic inflammatory response syndrome, but they don't meet the criteria for SIRS. That's the strange thing. So they don't actually have SIRS, as Dr. Shoemaker told me, because he looked at these people and said, no, no, they don't have SIRS mm -hmm. by definition but they have the SIRS marker. So they have the chronic activation of the innate immune system. So or what I call ISIS, innate system immune stimulation. They are, you can diagnose this over the phone. It's very different. And so they're young people, but most of the people, 50, 51, 52, 53, I mean, they're young, very, very commonly, often at the time of menopause, as Dr. Ross said. And here's what's interesting. At the time of menopause, you release mercury that has been stored in your bones, so you've been protecting yourself from the mercury. As your osteoblastic to osteoclastic ratio changes in favor of osteoclasts, you start to release mercury. And uh, Dr. Joe Pizzorno was just pointing this out recently, and we realized it's likely that you are releasing other toxins as well, because that's when these people tend to present. And in fact, treating them with BHRT helps as part of the overall treatment, definitely helps. So these are often APOE4 negative, and they're the ones that do the worst. The people who are APOE4 positive tend to do <coughs> better. It's a little bit like the Semen Indians that you heard about from Bolivia, where they many of them get parasites, about 70% of the natives get parasites, and if they have their APOE4 positive, they're able to do better with the parasites and don't suffer the cognitive decline. And the ones who are APOE4 negative suffer the cognitive decline. So actually, I'm having lunch on Monday with Tuck Finch, who was one of the co-authors of that, so we'll be able to talk more about this study. Very interesting work coming out of Bolivia. So however, what's, what we found, which is interesting, is the syndrome is non-amnestic in the APOE4 negative people. If you have a single copy, there tends, tends to be some problem with memory, as in the one that Dr. Ross was mentioned. She had memory problems as well. And then the ones who have two copies of APOE4, it's mostly memory. But for the ones that have this, type, this typical type three and who are either negative or, or heterozygous, it's so classic. They have problems with organization, problems with calculation, or visual perception. So it's a bi-parietal. It's virtually all parietal lobe. So we'll have one who has a parietal type aphasia. We'll have one who has parietal uh, dysfunction with visual perception. One who has difficulty with uh, adding and subtracting. We have people, so one person comes in and they smart, talk to you, you couldn't tell anything was wrong. You say, what's 10 minus seven? Absolutely no idea. And this is a person who was very good with math. That's the sort of thing you see. So it's very much of a cortical, less 
hippocampal sort of presentation. And I always ask the people when they write to me or call, I always say, well, you know, is there any problem with organizing? Oh, you know, completely problem. In fact, one of the guys uh, just from Tennessee the other day said something I thought was really striking. He said, if I send my wife to the store and say, get yeah, six things, she, her memory's great. If I say, if they're out of A, get B, gone, no, no more. She cannot do that executive, dis that executive function. And that comes from a parietal dysfunction, although executive is always thought to be frontal. That's a behavioral associated executive problem. When you have a parietal executive problem, you have what's called a small buffer. So your buffer is smaller. You can remember, but you can't change sets. So you can't say, oh, if you don't have A, get B. So, and I thought that was so classic for this person. And I said, hey, do you guys have any mold in your home? Um, and they said, oh, we have tons of mold. Why is that an issue? And I said, oh. and I said can you get to Savannah? And they said, yeah. So they're going to see Dr. Ross soon. So the negative family history, very common in people with type 3. Low triglycerides and or zinc is something we've noticed early on. We don't understand yet why that is. HPA axis dysfunction, so problems with, with cortisol, problems with testosterone, things like that. Depression, very common in this. It's much more common in this type 3 than it is in type 1 and 2. Problems with math or organization, problems um, exposure to dementogens, uh, mercury, mycotoxins, etc. So these really are dementogens. And we're finding out, as I mentioned, um, you know, Lyme you heard about, Marcon, surgical implants is another thing which can, which can activate the innate immune system. Candles, formaldehyde, other organics, the World Trade Center, all these things. And then precipitation or exacerbation by stress. Absolutely striking. We had a woman much better um, on the protocol. Um, her son made the football team um, at a major university. They started flying every weekend, stay up all night. Uh, she just completely crumped and had to go back on and quit flying all night. Um, atypical Alzheimer's. So often these people are misdiagnosed. Um, they were, they're told, we're told, oh, it's frontal temporal dementia or it's something else. Or oh, you're too young to have Alzheimer's. That's another thing we hear a lot. So they have these the markers that you heard about, high C4A, high TGF beta 1, low MSH, HLA, DR, DQ, very common with these so-called dreaded multiple biotoxin sensitivities like 4, 353, 11, 352B. Marcon's positive visual contrast sensitivity abnormalities. These are the things that Dr. Ross was telling you about. And as I said, most do not have the, the pulmonary, the allergic symptoms. Some do, but most don't. So they don't really fulfill the criteria. Potential relation, here's what's interesting. Type one and type two are related. They both are amnestic, typically. Um, they're a little different in the way they act, a little different in the age. Type three is like over here, and Lewy body disease is much more like type three than type three is like type one and two. And guess what, in the Lewy body disease, people, you find toxins. You find either SERS toxins or you find metallotoxins. So we're very interested in whether, in fact, um, we can treat Lewy body disease successfully uh, with the same sort of approach. It's the most difficult type of Alzheimer's. That's why we need to clone Dr. Ross and get about 100 more of her um, throughout the world. So here's an example. It's a 50 year old woman. This is a woman from Utah. Had a hysterectomy um, over the ensuing four years, word finding difficulty, disorientation, um, all sorts of problems. She started with depression. So they said, oh, yeah, you're just depressed. You're going to be fine. No, she was not fine. She had Alzheimer's disease. Neuropsych, poor semantic fluency. So what happens when you test the neuropsych, it's not just amnestic. And so they'll say, oh, they have parietal and sometimes temporal and frontal abnormalities as well. FDG PET, classic for Alzheimer's. So they, when you do the PET or when you do the cerebrospinal fluid, they have Alzheimer's. And yet, it's Alzheimer's as a response to some toxin that they've been exposed to, or toxins. She was seen at a major university, started on antidepressant. She didn't get much better, um, and ultimately, got much worse. She was an APOE 3.3, in her case, negative family history. HSCRP was not high, but her C4A was. You can see she had massive antifibroglobulin antibodies treated with recode and intranasal VIP, which seems to be very helpful for these people, the VIP. Um, she improved her memory. In fact, her, her husband said, and she did have some, some memory issues by, the, by that time, but they weren't the first things. Um, he said, you know, she's reading books again. Mm -hmm. They got into the car one day, and he wrote to me because they got into the car and he said, oh, I forgot the direction. She said, oh, no, it's 15 miles. You go right here, left here, left here, right here, right here. And he looked at her and he said, wait a minute, you haven't done that in three years. So she got much better. Then her son got on the football team. They started flying. She got worse. Now she's getting better again. 
Um, one other person to show you quickly, amyloid pet positive. She, this is a woman who actually went on a drug trial to remove mm -hmm. her amyloid. Each time she'd get it, she got much worse. After three or four, she said, that's it. I'm not doing this anymore. And she's ApoE4, heterozygote. MOCA was 24 at that time. Onset with depression, very typical. Non-amnestic presentation, executive problems, paraphasic errors, dyscalculia, so saying the wrong things. Low zinc, unbelievably low triglycerides. High copper zinc ratio, which we see very frequently. Shouldn't be over 1.2. Anti-amyloid therapy made her worse. Um, her C4A was high, her TGFA1 was high, she was marked once positive. One year on the protocol, her MOC is now 30, it's perfect, she's doing great. Uh, marked subjective improvement, um, C4A come down to normal, and she wrote to me this uh, a few months ago, um, and I thought this was you know, really, and at that time her MOC had only gone to 29. Since then she wrote me again and told me it's gone to 30. So the point here is that Alzheimer's should be a rare disease. That's the take home for all of us. This should be a very rare disease. If everybody gets checked when they're early, if everybody heads this off, either when you're asymptomatic or when you're beginning. I've actually heard an interesting uh, term called a, uh, it's a, it's a pre-survivor. So it's a pre-viver. Um, and this is someone who has been, basically been prevented before they ever got the illness. So you're a pre-viver. So we want everybody to be pre-vivers. Get things checked early. And if you do become symptomatic, get as early as possible. Get a very extensive evaluation so that you'll know. And the reality is we can make this a rare disease. So thanks again. Thank thanks. you.
Um, we're trying to put together different ways to do this and trying to make it as easy as possible, as inexpensive as possible, so that you can know. Because you're, you, you, said, you said one thing was very correct. The, the quicker that you, that you pull away the hormones, the worse it is for you. So if you're lucky, it goes like this very slowly. If you're unlucky, it goes like this. And as the Mayo Clinic has shown, very nice studies, if you actually have an oophorectomy, so you actually, when, you, when you're 40 or younger, so now you have high levels and you go to zero overnight, you double your risk for Alzheimer's. So you, the whole trick is you don't want it to go down quickly. And you want it to keep it optimal for many years to come. And if you're going to go down, okay, but you want to do it over a long period of time. That's, that's the trick. Yeah. And of course, there's all sorts of controversy about how long you continue. And this is a, a huge issue. But for cognition, you want to include optimizing not just you know those hormones, but also your free T3, and, uh, you know your DHEA and pregnenolone and your progesterone, all that sort of stuff. Yes. I was curious about what you said about um, the hormones and what you were just talking about. But yes. anyway, we always talk about going upstream to figure out the root cause. Yes. And you know the Dutch hormone test is a really good way to dig deeper in the new Dutch hormone test that's about to come out, it's supposed to be even better. Mm. But anyway, in my field of oncology, people with hormone replacement therapy, estrogen's a growth factor. Yeah. Mm. So I'm really concerned about when I look at someone with cancer and we see estrogen levels being high or if they're going through menopause, we like to swim upstream and figure out, oh, is it an HPA axis thing? Is it a thyroid thing? Is it an insulin thing? Is it, is it a growth factor thing? And try to figure out the underlying imbalance as opposed to just slapping a hormone replacement therapy on it, which might end, you know, increase all cause mortality. Don't you think we should be looking more at, you know, I know I had cancer. I was going through menopause really brutally with hot flashes and just horrible, typical menopause symptoms. Um, about five or six months into intense ketogenic diet, all my menopause symptoms went away, my thyroid condition went away, my polycystic ovarian disease went away, my brain cancer went away, and my breast fibroids went away. And then my, so the hormones were driving those things, and if I had gone hormone replacement therapy and put a Band-Aid on there, it could have, just given me death. It's, it's a really good point. So, as you can see from the from the diagram, there is this balance, and there's no question that there are, are situations in which cancer and Alzheimer's. You know, you kind of got to decide: do we want to? You know, one one man said to me, "Well, look, my wife is dying of Alzheimer's. So if you're telling me she could get cancer ten years down the road, you know, I'm going to take that risk. And she's going to take that risk." But you're right, other times you don't want to take that risk. So here's one possibility. So that we're interested in this. How, because this is a common issue. You know, lots of people put up BHRT, oh, but wait a minute, this person's already had cancer. Okay, and a, you know, an estrogen responsive cancer. So the way this works is that there's a set of receptors that we discovered called dependence receptors. They depend on all these things. And APP is an integrating dependence receptor. So it sums the input from all these different things. In fact, estradiol has a direct effect it turns on genes that actually clip the APP at the alpha site and give you the two good peptides. So there's no question. So here's a suggestion. Okay. In those people, maybe you go after BDNF and NGF and the other things, gotcha. because this thing is summing them. Right. So maybe you're not quite where you want to be with estradiol. Okay, because you're worried about the cancer, let's go after the NGF or the BDNF, maybe with more exercise. Now there's the whole coffee fruit extract that people are aware of now. Um, which is just coming out, that increases BDNF markedly. Um, and in general, we've been hearing positive things coming back from people who've been on it, in general. Um, and so we'll see, that could be helpful, we'll see, you know, see about that, but I think there'll be more and more. There are gonna be a lot of intranasal peptides where you're delivering the trophic molecule. VIP is the big one now, but they've already tested ADNP, which by the way, failed as a monotherapy, no surprise. Right. But in the future, as part of an overall plan, I think it has great potential. <coughs> NGF, same idea. So maybe you know you, you pick the ones that are going to support that network. Perfect. Thank you.